everyone. My name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I will have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe that they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today, we have my good friend, Andrew Hilbert on. Andrew was actually the first guest on My Horror Confessional, and he's come back to talk another movie. Andrew, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be back. Stink up the place again. <laughs> you're you're a classic, classic guest. One of the highest rated or highest listened to episodes that I have. Now I don't know if it's the first episode and everybody tries the first episode. No, no, no. That's because I had my mom and dad listen to it, and I told them they have to listen to it separately so you get separate downloads. And then I had. <laughs> Well, you said you have like three three listens, right? So my mom, my dad, and me. No, 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 way more. We're we're closing in on a hundred listens for, for you, buddy. A hundred listens. One hundred listens. Wow. At least, well, in uh, statistics or however they measure it, somebody pressed play. <laughs> One hundred different people pressed play, and then after that, I don't know if they fucking finished it. Let me tell you, they're probably not repeat customers. <laughs> Yeah, probably probably not. No, I think I had a a lot of fun on that episode. I know we it was like literally the first time I had interviewed anybody and, you know, talked I don't even think like my I I still don't. I am t- almost 30 episodes into the show and I don't have my format down the way I want it. In fact, today is going to be a little bit different. Typically we go really in depth line by line, scene by scene into the movie, but it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday. Andrew now has an additional child from the last time you were on, correct? Because you were on in like September of last year and probably even before that because I, I went live in September, but we recorded earlier than that. Yeah. And so now you have a new child. So Andrew doesn't have time to fuck around with me for three hours on, on a movie. So it's going to be a short one here. But Andrew, you are an author uh, and I know you had uh, a, something else come out since the last time you were on. So you want to tell us about that? Yes, it's a book of short stories called Inner Space. It's, um, you know, horror-ish, horror-adjacent, humor, absurd kind of stories. And uh, that's about all I'll say about it. Well, I will say more about it because I've read it, and it's great. It's uh, I love Andrew's writing, and he's my friend, so I, 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 I don't want to say this in front of his face. I want to take a shit on it. But I love his his writing and everything he does. In fact, I was a fan of Andrews even before I knew, and if, if, even before we were friends, because I found Death Thing before we were friends. Where did you find Death Thing? It was at, uh, you, well, you set me up, right? Because you you was in your old bookstore, Book People. <laughs> yeah, and I was, worked there too. Yeah, it was in the horror section, and I was just going through it, and I randomly saw this, and I was like, "Oh shit, this sounds awesome!" So. Uh, but since then, like in this particular new release, you have a couple of stories that really I enjoyed a lot. Well, one is Flesh House, right? Yeah. That one's an old one. That was uh, an old one. That's, that's when old I like one. to perform live back when we were doing live things. Yeah. And just hear the crowd groan. And then you also have, is it Bed Cage or Key? Uh, yeah, the you, Bed Cage. The you bed like cage. Two, two stories. You like two word stories. I, yeah, I do. Death bed, I, flesh house, bed cage, yeah. inner space. Yeah. What are so th- I was reading this one. I think this is the first story in the collection. and Or maybe it's a side. I don't remember exactly. But this is like the prototypical Andrew story. Like it was so you. And <laughs> look, could you tell everybody just, just a synopsis or, or, or a quick rundown of what that story is about the bed cage yes please yeah so a guy wakes up he's gotta go to work and uh, he he can't get out of bed it's not because he's like you know it's not like there's anything stopping him except for there's this this invisible barrier that's fallen on the perimeter of his bed his wife can get out of the bed she can't get back in and he, he can't get out and once things fall off the bed they can't go back on the bed so he's in quite the conundrum here. Yeah, turn off those notifications. <laughs> Damn it, you heard that, huh? Shit. And so do you feel comfortable sharing something that happened in your personal life 
apparently after this story came out or no? Well, which one, man? <laughs> <laughs> the the former, not the latter. <laughs> sure. Sure. Let's talk about it. Okay. So uh <laughs> late last year or sometime last year with the <laughs> We get the chat notification, and Andrew says he just he shat the bed. <laughs> oh my god, cut that! No, you're he not shat, that. <laughs> he shat the bed, and his wife and his newborn baby were not in newborn, the bed. Not newborn. What, how old was, was Polly? Was not two yet. Probably. Oh, this was before. This was before uh, yeah. Jesse was born. Yeah, it was before Jesse was born. Oh, so it's just Polly. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah. So I am sorry. Yeah, you're your, right. your infant child? No, your toddler child. Toddler, toddler. Let's get it right. Your toddler child and your wife were in the bed with you and you shat the bed. I did. <laughs> Not and your so, p- it was a life imitating art. But and it's, but you wrote apparently you wrote the story before this happened. Yes, long before that happened. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> When it happened, <laughs> did you say, oh, no, <laughs> it's just I, like bed cage. Here's what it says. I hope I can get out this motherfucking bed. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I am fucked. Oh, fuck, man. Yeah, well, you know, food poisoning. What can you do, man? Sometimes you eat a bad something and, you know, you just can't control yourself. Slips out. Slips past the gates. And <laughs> so, here's the thing. Can I just, I just also, you asked, you told me I could promote a couple things. Yes. So I, the bidet lifestyle. <laughs> okay. Did, didn't save me here. Didn't save me here. <laughs> yeah. But. Well, not, nothing could have saved you here. Nothing could have saved you. I will say that the bidet really helps clean up a mess. <laughs> did you, did, did you have the extension cord and hit the, your bed with the bidet? No, I'm just my pants and stuff, you know. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> We have a very close chat, and we talk about a lot of things. And for my birthday, Andrew got me a bidet. Um, I haven't used it yet. However, I did also let you watch. Uh, let I lend you lent you possession, and so we got a little tit for tat going on here. That once Andrew watches possession, I will then install the bidet. Yes, I'll watch possession <laughs> at some point. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, it just takes me forever to do anything. No, and and speaking of which. Last time you were on, I think I I, uh, I gave you three movies to watch. I don't oh, think you've shit. watched them. Which you one? You have the balls to come back <laughs> onto my show oh my promoting God. multiple things, and you haven't even watched them. You name them. That's not the point. <laughs> you can go point. back and edit it and make you look like – yeah, that's name them. That's not the point. It's probably some vampire movies. I, 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 yeah, sounds, I like, sounds like you didn't take them – very seriously, so I, yeah, I don't take religion very seriously. I'm sorry, Father. You know. <laughs> okay, so uh, Andrew, you've you've been on in the past. You kind of know what the format looks like. Uh, we've already talked about your history with horror and all that sort of stuff. So I, I wonder what your history is with specifically slasher films. Because last time we saw a Dracula movie, not a slasher. It's a vampire genre. This is a very slasher movie. So what I want to know is, what is your history with slasher films? Do you enjoy them? Do you hate them? That's what I, I enjoy them. I do think that um, Serial Mom, I you know, I, I I want to know your categorization of how Serial Serial Mom is whatever you know is or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but to me, I, those kind of things are less important to me, like the genres and how they fit in and all that kind of stuff. Those are less important to me in general, partially because I'm not like a completionist on all these things. But um, when it comes to slasher flicks, I mean, it's like one of those things where the ori- you know, the originals. Um, and I, I'm afraid I'm gonna offend you, Father, because I don't really know all these things. But well, I, I mean, say, you got like, yeah, yeah, you got you got like Halloween, you got like Jason, uh, Freddy Krueger in some senses, Scream, right? Mm-hmm. So when I was a kid growing up, Jason and Freddy Krueger were the scariest, but they were also they were like the most enticing, you know, because they were like really, really scary, satanic kind of stuff. And then when I got older. Scream was fun because while I do think there's a lot of like intended, intentional humor in in a lot of slashers, uh, Scream is one of those one of those movies that kind of like 
is meta commentary on everything while it's also a slasher. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a good slasher. It's funny. It's a good commentary on slashers and the whole like business around it without being like uh, academic. So I, so, so that's my history with slashers. I would say my favorite, like now that I'm older, I like Halloween, the original Halloween. I'm not like you or I worship it, but, but uh, I also really like Scream. But the original, I, the only two, I mean, I, I saw the original Scream uh, recently, but I've seen Scream 1 through 3 for sure. Um, Scream 1 and 2 are really great. I don't really remember 3. And if I saw 4, I don't remember it at all. Yeah. So you you don't subscribe, you say, to genres very much? It's not, it's not that I don't subscribe. It's that I don't spend any time, like, thinking about how something fits somewhere. I'm not, like, a librarian or, or an archivist. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'd, rather just, I'd rather just consume as much as possible. It's like, um, you know, are you talking about, like, a Whataburger versus In-N-Out versus this or that? You know, there's things that make all these things good or terrible, but I'd rather just consume you know, I'm not gonna think about it. I'm just gonna eat it. Empty calories. Empty, but they're filling me up. <laughs> yeah, look at me. I'm a flesh balloon. You're a very handsome man. Andy. Getting bigger. And it's great. <laughs> I feel okay. <laughs> well, you, you definitely got a dad bod. I'll give you that. Yeah, I got a dad bod. But a you're a dad, so you have the reason. You have, re- you have a reason for a dad bod. Yeah. So uh for Scream. Uh Scream was kind of a had didn't have a message, right? But it, it talked about the genre, it talked about horror movies, very similar to what the movie that you're here to talk about did with like mm. true crime, with the true crime genre. Yeah. Uh, so you are here to confess your sin of never having watched Serial Mom. Is that correct? Yes, Father. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Don't hurt me. That's a tiny water bottle. I'm about to get a water bottle. It's like a sip. Dude, I got a little um. A little fridge up here in my office that I can't have the full bottle. I have to have the little waters. Okay. Well, look at this. So, it's a yeah, I know. You're a baller. Plastic cup. Um, how did this particular movie pass you by? So it's interesting that it passed you by because we we're talking about Ricky Lake and all that. Yeah. So I watched a lot of daytime television because I stayed at my uh, grandma's house and my older cousins and my aunt would be around and my aunt loved Ricky Lake. And I remember my aunt and my mom talking about um, Serial Mom, talking about how Ricky Lake's in it, and they got to see it. And um, and then after, I mean, I remember these conversations very vividly. Nothing after that. Just completely left me by. And the funny thing is Max Booth, our mutual friend, um, recently, maybe within the last year, he recommended I watch um, Serial Mom. So when you suggested it, I think you suggested it, maybe Max suggested it in the group. Um, it was just a perfect opportunity because it takes me forever to do anything. Yeah. So, yeah. How did it pass me by? That's how it passed me by. I just, I didn't have, I didn't have the wherewithal to go look for it. Okay. We're here to talk about Serial Mom from 1994, written and directed by John Waters, who did Cry Baby and Hairspray, starring Kathleen Turner, who did Body Heat and Romance in the Stone, also starring Sam Watterson, obviously from like Law and Order, Ricky Lake. Everybody knows Ricky Lake from the Ricky Lake show. She was well, also. Does everybody know Ricky Lake? Who doesn't know Ricky Lake? I, mean, I know well, Ricky Lake. I know Ricky Lake. I, 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 I used to love watching daytime talk shows. Okay, what was your show? What was your go to? My go to? <sighs> I don't want to say it was Jerry Springer. It certainly wasn't Donahue, but it was Sally Jesse Raphael. <laughs> so Springer was a local Chicago guy. Yeah, so, so you liked him. We liked, like, I like Springer. But I, after I watched a while, Springer. it got trashy. Like, I mean, it was always trashy, I guess, but it got to the point where they're like recurring characters in the show. I was like, all right, this, Dude, it, this it, got it's, off the wall. It's honestly like what we're talking about a little bit. It was almost like a meta commentary <laughs> oh, on yeah. daytime television after a while. Uh, no, it was great. I loved it. He was my, he was, he was great. Sally, Jesse, Raphael. I also liked Donahue. I also liked, I also liked Ricky Lake. So. Yeah. I liked Ricky Lake a lot. She was more softer side of it. Like she didn't go as extreme. At least I don't remember 
it yeah. being as extreme. Maybe it was sensational. But also, uh, because I speak Spanish, I grew up in a Hispanic household, I had Cristina and Laura. Those are two, like, combine those together and you can you maybe have the level of Oprah in the Latin American world. But Okay. Like, and I, I, didn't, I didn't fuck with Oprah, really. But anyway, you interrupted me when I was talking about Ricky Lake. Everybody knows Ricky Lake. She's also uh, in Cecil B. Demented, which is another John Waters movie. He likes to work with a cast, uh, like a crew of characters. And so she was in a lot of his films, Hairspray, I believe. Um, starring a very young Matthew Lillard. Speaking of which, you were just talking about Scream. A pre-Scream Matthew Lillard. Uh, and Mink Stoll. She was in Pink Flamingo, Female Trouble. Two other John early Waters classics. Mary Jo Catlett, who is actually the voice of of Mrs. Puff from SpongeBob. I know you watched SpongeBob. I did not. I did not. Did not came old, so. And I'll say I was a little bit too older, too old for it. And Tracy Lords, uh, and she's uh, another John Waters regular. She was in Cry Baby uh, and also in Excision. So typically, what we do is, like I said, we go line by line. But what I want to do is, I just want to give a rough plot of it, and then we can kind of talk talk through it. Uh, and then we can both get out of here. We can get 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 into bed early. Get back to our to our chips, which I left early. Thank you. I appreciate for that. Father. They <laughs> yeah, weren't they, wafers. But we could get back to our respective ship beds. <laughs> exactly. All right. So I'm just going to read through this plot that I got uh, off of Wikipedia. That's how we're doing it tonight. And then, uh, if you want to talk, if you want to interject, go right ahead. Okay. And, uh, We'll just get through this, and then we'll talk about things afterwards. So, Beverly Sutfin appears to be an unassuming upper-middle-class housewife living with her dentist husband, Eugene, and their teenage children, Misty and Chip, in the suburbs of Baltimore. However, she is secretly a serial killer, murdering those who she perceives to slight her and her family or fail to live up to her moral standards. During breakfast, detectives Pike and Gracie question the family about the vulgar harassment of their neighbor, Dottie Hinkle. Beverly is later revealed to be the perpetrator, retaliating against Dottie for having taken a parking space at the local Joanne Fabrics from her. I didn't realize it was a Joanne Fabrics. Um, At a PTA meeting, math teacher Paul Stubbins criticizes Chip's interest in horror films, believing that Beverly's parenting is adversely affecting his mental health. Subsequently, Beverly runs Stubbins over with her car, killing him. Uh, The act is witnessed nearby by a stoner, Luann Hodges. The following day, Misty is upset when Carl Pageant stands her up for a date. Beverly spots Carl with another girl at a swap meet and fatally stabs him with a a tire iron. So I want to ask you, I want to back up a little bit here. That first kill with the math teacher. Mm-hmm. Do you think that was her first kill ever, and then we and we saw that, or are we dropping into a timeline here in which she's already killing? Okay, so I, I don't know about that, but the whole idea that she's a serial killer, it does seem that she's a little bit of a, uh, a, a it's like a opportunity killer, right? I do think that she. she I, here's what I think: I think she has killed people before, maybe tortured animals. Don't know, but she's done dark shit before, and this is where the wheels start coming off. She can't, you know. She's obviously super. Um, mm, what's that? Front frontal lobe. I don't know what that means. Yeah, let's look it up. I just want to make sure I'm not saying anything stupid. When now somebody, you're concerned about it, now it is frontal lobe. Oh, it's just it, 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 I don't I don't know. Did you mean like lizard brain? Lizard brain. Uh, what is it? Uh, when, when they when they lose their inhibitions, right? Okay. She has no. She she, she has nothing stopping her, and she uh, doesn't care. Like she she definitely turns into a spree killer, right? As spree as killing. Lizard. There we go. Yeah. There we go. So, what do you think, Father? <laughs> I appreciate you going along with the with the gag. Um, this is you know, a gag. <laughs> this is God. You know, we can't gag. You don't think God gags? Don't gag God. Okay. God gags you. 
There you 5 go. 5gkilledgod.com. 5 gkilledgodcom Yeah, let's make sure it still works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Oh, yeah, it still works. So what do you think? How, how much does it cost for a website like that? To park one for a year is like 12 bucks. Okay. And yeah. you were worried about it still being active. So well, I, I buy my man's book. books is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, buy, buy the book. Yeah. If you buy one book, I'll get another year on that <laughs> domain. Um, I, what do I think as far as whether or not she has killed before? Right. I, I think she has. I mean, it happened so at, at this. Well, I don't know, right? Because she was slighted before, as we as I just said. Uh, the girl, the woman, sorry, um, stole a parking space from her, and she was just harassing her. Th- these calls that she's doing—they're so insane. They're off the wall. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's not just a prank call. It's crazy. And then her voice gets deeper. It's just like it's insane. Um, yeah, Kathleen Turner did a great job. Like, can yeah. you imagine? Like, you have to have. So, uh, for example, I, I saw Trilogy of Terror last night. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen Tril- Trilogy of Terror with Karen Black? No. So it's this uh, this 1970s uh, horror TV movie, and in it, it's an anthology movie, and it's three. It's a trio, obviously, trilogy. Yeah. Terror. And in the last one, she's being attacked by this devil doll by this African. What is it like a whatever like a, and it's possessed by her, and in the I won't give away the spoiler, but in the end she she has to like she looks so, so Karen Black is a beautiful woman, and in the seventies and the eighties, and probably to this day, unfortunately, older women it's it's difficult for older women to get movies. In this movie, she looked terrible, like she didn't look beautiful. She looked completely fucked up at the end of this movie. And I I thought like, man, it was so brave of her to do that because it could make it difficult for her to get her other parts in the future. And the same thing with this movie, like Kathleen Turner was using, I think she used, she said cunts and like, she was like just swearing and like become, you know, killing kids and all that stuff, attempting to kill kids and all that shit. I was like, damn, like she did the thing. Like she wasn't afraid to do it. And one of the reasons I was reading up on it, one of the reasons that John Waters hired her was because when they made her an offer, she just accepted the offer. She didn't have any notes. Yeah. She, she was like the fourth or fifth actress that they went to. Uh, and some of the bigger actresses in Hollywood at the time, and everybody else came back with notes and she didn't. And, and, and uh, John Waters was like, yeah, let's go with her. So the big names, Meryl Streep, Glenn Close, Oh, yeah, it's, it's, I can't imagine it being then, for sure. Right. Well, I think for me, though, I don't have a history with Kathleen Turner. Yeah. Like, I, I don't, I didn't see romance. I think I saw Romance in Stone once, and I, I think the other one, Body Heat, that's like, I don't know, it's like a, a sex romp or something. I don't I saw, know. I saw Romancing the Stone in my junior high Spanish class. My because... teacher, My teacher did not want to teach. And he just he just played thirty minutes at a time and just sat down. He also there's no played, Spanish in there, is there? No, nothing. He, he, be... That's why I don't speak Spanish, man. That's it's all, why. His, it's all his fault. Yeah, uh, but he he also claimed Gatorade didn't have water in it. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a public school you went to? Of course. Come on, did you go to public school? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, for high school I did. At Gracie's suggestion, Eugene discovers Beverly's serial killer memorabilia beneath their mattress, which includes recordings from Ted Bundy on the week of his execution. That evening at dinner, Chip tells the family about his friend Scotty's suspicions. Beverly departs at that point, fearing for Scotty's life, the others head for his house. Unbeknownst to them, Beverly intends to kill Ralph and Betty Sterner for calling Eugene to treat the former's toothache on a day Eugene and Beverly plan to spend bird watching that's a little bit uh roundabout so anyway she stabs betty with scissors borrowed from rosemary ackerman and pushes an air conditioner from their window onto ralph meanwhile the rest of the family and the police arrive at scotty's house only to find him (laughs) i forgot about this part only to find him masturbating to an erotic film (laughs) it's great i mean here's here's the thing that i love about this movie it's like it's like a cartoon right it's like tom and jerry the scissors, 
the air conditioning, and then here's where it really gets like Tom and Jerry. The guy masturbating on his couch to an erotic <laughs> I used to love that part in Tom and Jerry all the time. <laughs> it was great. It was always weird because it was like the only human character. I I, I I just, every, so the thing that's like funny about this like slasher, killer kind of thing is that it's so cartoonish and the weapon isn't the same. It's just, just like, it's almost like passion killings every single time. Um, I don't know. It's great. Air conditioner falls on you. You're dead. New York. <laughs> Baltimore. So on Sunday, police follow the Sutfins to church as Beverly is named as the prime suspect in the Sterner's murders. The service abruptly ends when everyone flees in panic after Beverly sneezes, during which she escapes as police attempt to arrest her. So that sounds silly, right? The yeah. service abruptly ends when everyone flees in panic after Beverly sneezes. But the the, the tension that they've built up and all that with the, the police kind of slowly closing in on her and she sneezes and everybody just goes into a panic, just like, ah, and then that allows her to escape. Yeah, I thought that was that. I was, you know, that was telling of the future. Yeah. So then she hides at the video store where Chip is employed. Emmy Lou Jensen, a customer, argues with Chip over being fined for failing to rewind a videotape, calling him a son of a psycho. So Beverly follows Jensen home and fatally strikes her with a leg of lamb as she watches Annie. Scotty witnesses the attack nearby and Beverly spots him and pursues him after carjacking a passerby. So this part, I just have to talk about. I, I, so she she's pursuing Scotty and she's stolen this. Or she's jacked this dude for a minivan. And then her family is out looking for her in their van, in their car. And she she cr- crosses them and they, they, they point at her and they see her. And she just goes like, hey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, man, it's so good. It's, it's like, uh, it's amazing. I, I just love what they were doing there. Oh, I love it. And here's the crazy thing is like, now I can see how this would happen. Yeah, if, if I just carjacked a car and saw my saw uh, my wife and kids in a car nearby, I would probably wave to them. Hey. <laughs> With a heavy, hey, nothing, nothing, everything's cool here. No problem. Everything's great. I'm just about to murder this fuck. <laughs> yeah. So then they end up at a um, music venue called Hammerjacks, and Beverly set Scotty on fire during a live performance by the Camel Toes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real band. But they're not really called Camel Toes, right? No, I forgot toes. what they're called. But yeah, I don't yeah, 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 yeah. That song was pretty sick. And then the Sutphin family arrives as Beverly is arrested. So then the, the kind of the last third is of the movie is this, this bench trial that she has. And Beverly's trial becomes a media sensation. She's dubbed Serial Mom and both Chip and Misty profit off of her notoriety during the opening arguments beverly's lawyer claims that she is not guilty by reason of insanity but she but he is promptly dismissed representing herself beverly systematically discredits every witness against her by exploiting their own vices while hodges is too high to provide credible testimony during pike's testimony the courtroom is distracted by the arrival of suzanne summers who is cast as beverly in a television in a television film Beverly is acquitted of all charges. Throughout the trial, Beverly expresses contempt at a particular juror for wearing white shoes after Labor Day. Beverly follows her to a payphone and fatally strikes her with the receiver. Before realizing the truth, Summers angers Beverly into an outburst attempting to pose for a photo op. The juror's body is then discovered. So that's very quick rundown of the movie. What did you think when, when you had first seen this movie? Uh, so I thought like, man, this is exactly, I mean, this is John Waters and like, I'm, like I said, I'm not a completionist, but it's always nice to, to see something of someone you respect. Like, you know, he, I respect him as an artist. I respect his whole, his whole aesthetic, but this aesthetic is like exactly what I like. It's like super, super perfect kind of like suburban family, Norman Walk, Rockwell, but everything is completely absurd. Right. Um, so I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. Um, I thought it was a good commentary and you didn't really need, you don't even, you don't eat, there's layers to enjoyment. It's like you can enjoy it on its face for what it is and you can dig deeper and see the deeper things he's commenting on, which, uh, is nice. Um, 
So you I said you're a fan me. of uh, John Waters. What have you? What other? Have you seen other movies of his? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Have you seen like Cry Baby? Cry Baby, Hairspray. Um, you know, uh, maybe like almost twenty years ago now, when you when people go through those phases of uh, trying to find the weirdest stuff, Pink Flamingos. You know, um, but also like uh, when I was working at Book People, um, I had a he had two books that came out in my time there. One of them was called Role Models, and one of them was called um, uh, it was about uh, God. What's that called? It's hitchhiking. He was hitchhiking. He, he, yeah. he hitchhiked across America and then wrote about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I actually read most of that book while I was working at Book People, like on the floor, just because I was that I was on that floor of the nonfiction stuff. Uh-huh. So I read it. I just kind of have a respect for the way he goes about things and like the way that he's like unabashedly weird, you know, yeah. and the way that he like collects kitsch and can see like the beauty in in like this right the society we live in which is like completely commercial um i think that i think there's a there's something about him where it's like it's a sincere it's a sincere commentary on all these things but it's also a sincere like appreciation for these kind of things Mm -hmm. um we it's we grow up in, in a culture surrounded by these things and it's so easy to be like, oh, this sucks. Oh, my God. There's it, everything's so the same. And, you know, but he's finding the beauty in these things. And he's finding, like, the characters connected to these things. Like, Serial Mom. The characters connected to having, like, a perfect suburban life. And it all, like, comes crashing down. He's not making fun of. He, he's not. It doesn't seem like he's making fun of these people. He's making fun of the world not the individual people in there, which I think is like, you know, if I was a smarter person, I could probably articulate that better, but that's just like how I feel generally about his work. Yeah. And in this particular, in this movie, but also in his other works, uh, he is like subverting the norm that is white suburban America, right? Like this white picket fence. I think they literally have a white picket fence or at least there are some in their neighborhood. And, um, so this perfect family, and actually the family unit itself is not perfect, but it's it's really yeah, good. They're dedicated to each other. Yeah, like they all get along. They were all like leave it to Beaver, like the yeah. Cleavers. Yeah, and I and I like that, and because it made sense uh, that at the end they stuck with her, even though like um, they're all profiting off her. Yeah, t-shirts. they're all profiting off her. But even towards towards the end, when they after they see after she uh, drives by and waves, they're like, "Oh no!" A- actually, after she uh, is acquitted, they go like, "What do we do now? Like, do we let her come home?" <laughs> yeah. They're all like terrified of her, you know, because she's <laughs> yeah. a fucking serial killer. So we were talking about the family and the the, the nuclear family that that they have, and it was good. Um, but then when you go when you extend that outwards, like she has a lot of hate for anybody who does the slightest thing, but she, she like has a really close relationship with her garbage men or her, well, they know the recycle, the, the people who pick yeah. up the recycling. Yeah. And typically I feel like in the society, the, the, uh, the, the garbage men and the people who pick up your lawn clippings and all that sort of thing, nobody really talks to them. Like <clears throat> they come, well, at least for me, they come in the morning and they're kind of, they do their job and you come home from work, whatever, you put the bins away. I, myself, I tip all those people and they, they, they will bring my bins back to, to the side of my house because I tip them. So you should be tipping your garbage. So you wake garbage. up early enough to tip them. No, 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 no. I tip them at Christmas time. Okay. Once once a year, I tip the mailman, I tip the garbage people, the recycle people, the guy who p- picks up the lawn clippings. I tip everybody, but the only people who kind of reciprocate that are the the garbage men, the people who do the garbage, like the recyclers. They'll bring my stuff back to me, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Feels well, I mean, pretty, feels pretty nice. Yeah, the mailman should give you uh, Tim's cash <laughs> rewards. Well, the mailman will come and personally deliver something that would if it looks important. He'll come in and knock on the door and, and and give it to me instead of just leaving it in the mailbox. Yeah. So I like that. 
Yeah, y'all should tip your. You should be tipping the people who not not just to get shit back, but because they do fucking hard work all the time. But anyway, in our society, they're not valued. I don't think. Right. And then, but she has a very close connection to them, and I thought that was kind of cool. Like, Beverly is a cool mom. Like, she she's into horror films with her son Chip. Like, she she goes down uh, into her bedroom and they're watching Blood Feast, I believe. And like, she asks him to rewind it because she wants to see that bloody part. Yeah. And even he, he's like, "Oh fuck, really?" So like, she's a cool she's a cool person. She's just got one flaw. And she likes to kill assholes. Well, I think um, you know. The, the, the garbage man storyline, you know, we we're supposed to record this episode a couple times. So I watched it a while ago. <laughs> yeah. That helps her out because the other person is an asshole, right? Uh, the Her other person isn't an asshole. Oh, wait, she's, yes. Yeah. The neighbor is an asshole only in that she doesn't recycle. That's right. That's, that, that's, that's her right. fault. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so even late, later in the movie when she's on the stand, and um, Beverly says, "You don't recycle, do you?" And the whole the whole um, courtroom goes, oh! and she's like, "I don't have the room in my kitchen." <laughs> That's right. But well, actually, you have a, a some diatribe that you go on every time we talk about recycling. Yeah, you want to? Did you want to? Yeah, go into yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. Single stream recycling, as they do in almost every major American city, is largely a complete waste of time and resources. If we were, if we were going to do recycling correctly, we would be separating our glasses, our plastics, and our papers, and they would get picked up by separate, um, separate trucks. The reason why we don't do that is because we're lazy, society knows that so they built an inefficient system to solve a problem that, that, that cannot be solved this way. It's a system that placates our laziness and makes us feel good about ourselves uh, when in actuality it just makes us feel good about ourselves and doesn't solve the problem. Um, so when you put papers with plastic and glass and all that stuff, almost all those papers get wet they can't be recycled. Most of our plastics are mislabeled. Most of our plastics say they're recyclable, but they're recyclable in theory only. Not every municipality can recycle certain types of plastic. So your milk jugs can't do it. Can no longer stand the terrible I'm sorry. Uh, your Tetra packs, you know, the, the, those, like, they look like they're cardboard, but they have like oil in them and stuff. And they usually like soy milk or oat milk. Those are absolutely not recyclable. Those just need to go straight to your trash. Because what happens is when there's a contamination, it's in the recycling. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When there's a contamination in single stream recycling, most of the products around it also have a paper on it. And the last thing I'll say about this, is, although it's a huge issue, is uh, we benefited, America benefited from throwing our recycling to uh, other countries that, that were actually wanting our recycling because they were, you know, that, that's what we, that was, they're buying it and remaking other things. Now we can't use places like China uh, to do our recycling because they do other things. They don't want to trash. They produce enough trash on their own to recycle their own stuff. Now the problem is, America doesn't have any facilities to recycle our own recyclables to make new stuff. So largely it's just sitting in a, in a warehouse and then to finally get thrown into a landfill anyways. And rent. Wow. Wow, Andrew. How do you know this? Did you write a research paper on this? Did you just go down a rabbit hole? No, I, I, <laughs> I, I read an article once about it. And then, and then I later I thought this is a this would be a really funny thing for a really neurotic uh, private detective to, to rant about, and so I researched it more when I was writing Bang Face. Bang Face, All yeah, right, and, and Bang this. Face, <clears throat> Bang Face goes on a similar similar rant. So let me ask you this: literally, what happens to my recycling right now? You're because we're so single stream. We're single stream. I would probably say less than 50% of it actually gets recycled. And most of it goes to a landfill. I don't know, though. It's, it, it is actually, it requires you as a citizen to do more. And the city will not equip you with how to do it. 
They're not going to give you three different recycle bins. And if they did, they'd still throw it in the same truck anyway. Yeah, so, I was about it to say. <laughs> yeah. so it's a problem that that we really should figure out how to how to fix. I love it. Well, that's the show. Thanks. Thanks for coming on, man. That's all I wanted to talk about. You better not cut that. I feel like that was like the most I articulate thing I've ever said in my life. I will not cut that. I will definitely be leaving that. In. Okay. But I think in this movie, it is not single stream because I remember seeing uh, Beverly separating her plastics or like her. So she had a paperweight, a paper a pile. She had a plastic pile. And, and probably a glass pile. Because Beverly knows what's up, dude. Yeah. It's, Beverly is like, is the law, right? She is the enforcer. Minor infractions get punished disproportionately. She she's Judge is, Dredd. Right. She's the law. She's the law. That's what she wrote. She's like, she's enforcing societal norms on people. And, uh, and the punishment is disproportionate to the crime. But internally, within her family, is very loving and is very forgiving of her children when they make "quote unquote" mistakes, like her uh, Ricky Lake was chewing gum, yeah. and she said, "You know how I, I hate when you chew gum." Um, but so let's talk a little bit about the the kills. All right, so we have the the teacher getting run over by the car. Right, pretty, easy. pretty cool kill. Easy, yeah. easy kill. Um, what else do we have? We have uh, the two, the the husband and wife. They get killed by the air conditioner, yeah, and geez. what else? She gets scissors, right? Scissors, right. Yeah, scissors. <laughs> pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, what was another? Kill? Wait, 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 does does she just beat the the juror up? With the with the hey, phone at the end, yeah. I don't know because in, in that uh, wrap up it, it said that she was killed. I don't know if you can kill somebody with a with a with a receiver, you crack a skull or something. Man, those things were heavy back in those days. The public, <laughs> it was like a public phone, wasn't it? Yeah, but she didn't like pick up her public phone. She just took the receiver. Yeah, the receiver. Over that was, no, yeah, that you know what? You're right. That <laughs> shit was you solid do plastic. You could do it. Yeah, because I remember like getting in heated arguments on the payphone and just. Whack at this shit, or even just being a stupid idiot and just doing it. I didn't even need to be. No, they did not. They did not break. No, they didn't. They, did it was like a, they, were, they were made out of Nokia phones, and that's a joke from 2010. Yeah, what's what's Nokia, please, Grandpa? <laughs> All right, let me. I'm trying to think of uh, the other kills. Um, uh, what, oh, she killed the the that one lady with the with the turkey leg. Oh yeah, that was hilarious. Oh, you can't you can't silly. kill somebody with a turkey. I mean, you probably could, but not in that way. Yeah, that was that was silly. But that's why I love it. It's a cartoon. It's great. Yeah. And then she burns that dude on, on the stage. Yeah. That was good as well. Um And everyone thought it was part of the performance. Didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They yeah, did. yeah. It, there's a lot going on in this movie. And I feel like if it, it surface level stuff is like Oh, that's ridiculous! Oh, that's ridiculous! But if you, he's like, he, he is like a purveyor of kind of more, not I wouldn't say extreme, but like almost like uh, it is extreme. I mean, it, it's more extreme, right? He's a more absurd, extreme person. But he's also commenting on like the um, extreme nature of entertainment, right? The camel toes are playing this ridiculous song, and. And uh, they burn this person to death, and nobody in the audience can tell if it's part of the show or not, right? Yeah. And then everybody is so uh, is so obsessed with Serial Mom uh, as a celebrity, right? <laughs> the her only entertainment is that she killed people, and it's real. So there's a lot of commentary about like what society is the separation of reality and fiction. And this predates the like the huge uh, true crime wave that happened in America by just a couple of months because this came out in ninety four, but it came out just a couple of months before the OJ Simpson, uh, yeah, the whole incident, um, and, and and then the trial and all that sort of stuff. And now too, I feel like we had a real resurgence in the last five years of true crime obsession with podcasts, 
Like every, oh yeah, like yeah. Uh, my favorite murder came out, and then they did well, and then they exploded, and then just everybody else started a, a, a true crime podcast, and that exploded, and now it's like yeah, it's it's like the renaissance. It's probably even more popular than even more popular than it's ever been. Um, but then like you did have like true was it true TV or what's the the channel that that shows all those uh, court um, TV court TV yeah. yeah. Like the Court TV and C-SPAN, all that sort of stuff. They would they would show these things now, and this predates it by just a couple of months. So that's what, how like forward thinking he is. He saw something in America, in in the, in our society, how we love a salacious story. Yeah, and, and he wrote about it. But there's also other things in here. For example, the son Chip is uh, addicted, or not addicted to, but uh, a, a horror fan, a horror movie fan, yeah. right? And he, mm-hmm. he he watches that as an outlet for for whatever uh, problems or issues he's got, or maybe I'm projecting because that's what I do. Yeah. But but he um, and he actually works at a uh, a VHS, uh, VHS store, place. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if what um, John Waters is saying there because he makes these salacious movies and he makes like. Uh, um, crybaby and and uh, female troubles and the other stuff. The mom, the serial mom, the loves those horror movies. So I don't know if he's saying something there or if he's saying there's there's no connection. I don't know. I I see. I, I the whole thing about it, I I don't think that he's saying anything in particular about horror movies and their relation to and their relation to people's actions. I don't think he's saying anything about that. I think what he's saying more is like he's commenting more on like. Um, the obsession is he, 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 how it's consumed rather than like uh, the creation. Cause if you look at it, the son is actually pretty well adjusted for a, for a teenager. He's not, you know, he's watching horror movies the way that most people watch horror movies as an outlet. Right. Whereas obviously there's an obvious difference in his mother's uh, watching of horror, <laughs> horror movies. Um, but you know, not smart enough to make the actual, you know, uh, argument for that. But I do think that he's commenting more on the consumption rather than the creation and, and the obsession being that chip is uh, well adjusted watching fiction. Whereas, uh, society, I mean, he turns because he starts selling serial mom t-shirts, but he's exploiting, uh, our fascination at rubbernecking at a traffic stop at, at, at an accident. <laughs> we, we just found out that you're rubber. You're a rubbernecker. <laughs> yeah, I am a rubbernecker. Um, all right. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the shit that, that Beverly was saying to Dottie Hinkle. So, so what if she says, um, <laughs> What does she say? I don't have it. I don't have. I don't have any notes. I fly. You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a cowboy. So the cops come and they they show her this note that was given to Dottie Hinkle, and in the note it says, "I'll get you, pussy face." And so she so she looks at it and she says, "No woman would say the p word out loud." So she, <laughs> yeah. And then um, so the co- the cops leave and she goes and she prank calls Dottie Hinkle. <laughs> And she says, is this the cocksucker residence? <laughs> 4215 Pussy Way, zip code 212, fuck you, fuck face. And she's cracking up. Yeah. All that because Dottie Hinkle took her parking spot. I love uh, it. I love yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't, I, again, like, I don't know what what that says about her that – is she just a psychopath or if she had another release, if she wasn't this fifties stereotype for a mom, if she had some other release, if she was allowed to watch horror movies more, or not allowed, but if she watched horror movies more, would she get some of this aggression out? She wouldn't be calling people <laughs> pussy faces or something I, or fuck faces, you know? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. And I, I don't know if there has to be, you know what I mean? I don't know. If there has to be an explanation. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's hilarious um, on its face, and I do think that maybe there's there, there there's some kind of like dichotomy or juxtaposition presented 
by the neighbors who all seem quite a bit older than she is. Right. Mm. And they're like having tea and all kinds of stuff. So it's like, obviously like while she's living a very stereotypical life as a nuclear family, all that kind of stuff, these people live alone, they're friends and they're like the P word. Oh God. Um, I don't know that he's saying anything more other than that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that there needs to be, but I don't know. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just yeah. a fucking moron you got in your show here. Um, so she was after she killed the teacher that night, she's like really horny and she wants to have sex. And like, she's like really into it. And her husband's like, Oh wow. You're like, you're acting really different. And like, she got really off on, on, on the, on these killings. So, you know, I don't know. Repre- so I think a lot of it is repression. Yeah. Maybe that was her first kill. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. right? Maybe that was. Because otherwise, he would have been like, "Oh, it's just you know that time of month where like you know seems yeah. like every once in a while you just get really hot." Yeah, <laughs> I think um, first of all, Sam Waters Waterson's uh, performance is like the same performance he gives in every single thing, which is yeah, he's bad. the same. <laughs> he's great. I think he's great. He is exactly what he needed to be. But there's also like you know his facial expressions, just like. Yeah. He's got the eyebrows and he's he got the that. eyebrows. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, re- I think it is like a repression thing, commentary on repression. You know? uh, I will say also, uh, Ricky Lake was horny the entire, the entire movie, giving the eyes to every authority figure, every bad boy. Like, the, oh yeah. Uh, that one, that one the detective. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. like, what the hell? And then her boyfriend or, whatever potential boyfriend and then also later on that photographer yeah it's every single every single guy that that, that showed up she has had some kind of like you know obviously uh there's some scent in the air well i like it i like that he no there's not just like two-dimensional characters like all of his characters have something else to that. Maybe except for the, the father, Sam Watterson or whatever. Yeah. He, he's really just him. But like Ricky Lake has something. Um, Kip has something. Um, you know, even like the, some of the characters that she, she kills later on, that, that one older lady, like at, when they're at the flea market, she like, She's looking for a Faberge egg, but she switches the price tag yeah. on, on those things. It's like, okay, I, you know, I, I enjoy just a little bit of depth of just getting to know what kind of person this is who's who's about to die. Right. And now that you bring that up, there's like uh, these these people represent like polite society. Yet, as soon as no one's looking or they think no one's looking, the, you know, it, it changes. Which right. is also another aspect of re- repression, right? And another aspect of of uh, the law being disproportionate or whatever. But I do think that's a, that's a funny it's a funny thing about it. Yeah, they're all oh, bad. Yeah. I mean, not bad, but they're all just repressed. Everyone's repressed. Uh, one of the other kills that we forgot was the the kill uh, when she kills Carl in the washroom, and she follows him with that poker stick. Yeah, like, gets him in the back, and then like pulls out his liver. Or kid, or kid, I yeah, don't know what that looks like. Something gallbladder. Yeah, that, yeah, that looked pretty nasty. I like that part. Yeah. No, it was. Yeah, I think that was probably the most horror. Well, like that was probably the most like obviously they're going for like the gory horror thing. I think everything else was pretty cartoonish. That was cartoonish too. It was like itchy and scratchy. Wait, what the hell was that? Yeah. So, what about you, John Waters? What's your history with John Waters? You like John Waters? I, I like John Waters, but I've only I, I have a um, limited amount of movies that I've seen. So I've seen Cry Baby and this. I haven't even yeah. seen Hairspray because I don't like musicals. Yeah, you like musicals. You have some musicals you like. Yeah, I like um, Phantom of the Paradise. We just saw that a couple of days ago with with, with uh, Zach, and I like Anna and the Apocalypse because I don't know, that one's just cool. But you know, I, I don't like when people just start breaking out in song and dancing. Like yeah. if you're on a stage and there's a reason for you to be singing, then, then that's cool. But okay, that, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I think uh, you know if you if you watch interviews with John Waters too, he's just like a pleasant person. You know, 
very smart, pleasant, kind person. And also there's, there's that Simpsons episode, which is a classic. What's the Simpsons? I know he's on it, but I don't remember what the he's. Um, yeah, he's like bowling. I think he's. I think Homer meets him bowling. They become great friends, and then Mar Marge says something like, "Homer, he. I think he. Uh, he prefers the company of other men." And Homer says, "Who doesn't?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's the episode where 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 he's worried Bart's gay. <laughs> And he sits, he sits Bart out in front of a billboard, and it just shows like a bunch of, it just a, a bunch of like girls in bikinis and it's Laramie lights. It's like the cigarette Laramie. Yeah. And, and and Homer, after a couple hours, Homer picks him back up. He's like, "So what do you feel like, son?" He's like, "I kind of feel like a cigarette." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great episode, and it's one of those episodes that got almost got. It was one of the only episodes that got pushback from Fox, like heavy pushback. And they didn't, uh, you know. It, it, now it's probably more problematic than it was back then. But back then it was it was probably a little more uh, edgy and groundbreaking when it came to the you know a gay rights and all that. Now it probably be seen as a little bit cringy. But at the time it was like, um, you know, Fox was uncomfortable because it was showing a gay person as being normal. What season was that? Do you remember? It was like it was later. It was like season eight or nine. Okay, right before, think, right before ten, I think. That's how eight and nine works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but but, but, but but ten is basically where most people agree the quality starts going down a little bit. Yeah, this is not who shot Mr. Burns. Andrew, no, our I, other, our we do. Ha- I know we have two defunct podcasts together, but let's try to focus. I'm hoping that this one doesn't become defunct. So, okay. if you could please, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. But anyway, uh, so I wanted to focus a little bit on the the, the uh, last third of the movie, which was the the God damn it, the court, court trial. Case. Yeah, yeah. So there's this one scene in the courthouse where the, the prosecutor is starting to talk about you know what the fuck Beverly just did, and he, he says something like, "She killed six innocent people." Then we see her counting her fingers. She's like, "Wait a minute, what? One, two, three, four. Oh man, just like little um, little jokes like that, man. I fucking love. Yeah. No, that yeah, I, I love jokes like that too. All right, I so also then like uh, reaction jokes. <laughs> so this scene where she kind of like picks apart every witness that she has against them. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> With Dottie Hinkle, she just got her mad, right? And then she just made her say, fuck you. Fuck you, you whore. Are you insane? And then says, you lousy pig fucker. And then they like take her out of the courtroom and she's like no longer a credible witness. Yeah, just a, just. I love the thing that she has that that running joke that they have with that Hinkle, where like she's just so sick of her shit from being called like a pig fucker the whole time. She's <laughs> she flies off the handle at anything. <laughs> uh, all right, so then the the second one is um, the stoner. So she was high; nobody believed her. Um, and then the detective. States that he found serial killer stuff in her gar- in her garbage, and that's when the the garbage men, the recycle bill recyclable people, come on the stage and uh, on, or they say that they found stuff in his garbage too, and they say they found chicks with dicks in his garbage. So there's like never judge a person by what they read. So it's a good point. It's a good point, but it's I think probably a problematic joke. At this point, but who knows? Because John Waters himself is gay, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, if it's problematic, I apologize. But that's what they said uh, in the movie, and Andrew co-signed it. So, yes, I, I, it, but if you want, if you take a step back, so knowing that's a, it's knowing it's a commentary, right? Obviously, the things that you're hiding and repressing are the things that are going to be used against you. It's, a, it's not really commentary whether that's right or wrong. Yeah. In the movie. All right. And then the, the, the last one we have is Marvin Pickles. He's the glory hole guy. He saw the murder in the bathroom. And um, 
she this is where she's like opening her legs to him like over yeah. and over and over again. <laughs> and he's just like, he just like gets so horny. He gets all horned up. And he's like, I don't see anything. <laughs> Which was I it's, mean it's, it's men are trash, so I don't I don't <laughs> think this is too far too far gone. But then um the prosecution rests and so does Beverly to the support of the courtroom. Uh and then uh, there's this one scene where her and Suzanne Summers are like, well, she, Suzanne Summers is saying she's like a feminist hero. She was framed by the police. And then they both say is like, she, she's outside the courtroom and um, Beverly's inside the courtroom. And she says, all I ask is that you find me innocent of these terribly untrue charges. And I just thought it was, that was great. We, that's the end of the movie. Uh, I, I love this movie. I had so much fun watching it. This is a, a high like high rewatchability for me that's always important when i'm when i'm talking about like whether or not i like the movie is whether or not i can watch it again yeah i, de- I can definitely watch this one again i just think what john waters did uh what he continued or he has he, i think he's working on a movie right now but he hasn't done one in like a couple of years but what he's done throughout his career is like of subverting the 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 uh what we see in society and and, and reflecting it back to us via his like his uh, what he what he sees it as it's like razor sharp and i just i, I really enjoy it a lot um i do want to see more of his stuff i know what's the one that you said you saw um not female troubles is the, the his most famous the, like, the most famous set. of the pre pre like main oh hairspray, yeah. hairspray is probably his most well, this, is it the one with divine <laughs> it's one of the one with with the pink flamingos is like pre pink flamingos. is that where divine eats shit like literally eats shit i believe so. if memory serves it's, yeah it, it's a wild movie yeah do you remember anything like do you no but i saw i mean i saw like 20 years ago like pink flamingos was like my you know high school exploration days and stuff so it was a long time ago um but it was extreme you know it was like nothing i've ever seen before and it remains to this day like nobody's ever made anything that like that yeah. um yeah, man. Uh, so funny. You don't like you don't like musicals, but Hairspray is like the most. It's is it, I think it is his like his breakout kind of hit. It still touches on. It's still John Waters. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and you've you've seen Cry Baby. Everyone's seen Cry Baby. I, I really like Cry Baby. Yeah. I got to see that over again. Um, all right, so I guess we can kind of. Well, well, first of all, was there anything else you wanted to say about this movie before we go into ratings? I love Suzanne Summers. I love it. That was great. That was real cool. Yeah. I love that she played herself and it was really funny. And it was like the perfect, this, I think the mark of a good commentary is it's timeless, right? It's a good satire is satirical of society and it's, you can just place it anywhere you want and it it works. It works, you know, the, you know, the nineties, it works now. It's still a razor sharp commentary. Um, And I, I think it's great. And it, and the other thing about John Waters' style that I, I didn't get to say is that there, there, there's almost like a very like a commercial quality to it, where it looks like a lot of things are framed as commercials. The colors are very vibrant, all that kind of stuff. It makes you feel a certain way, and then that adds to the absurdity, adds to the cartoonish nature of it. So that, that, that that's all I'll say about it. But I, I loved yeah. it. I thought it was great. All right, so. Um... Our, you know, our scale here, we judge things on as a scale of uh, upside down crosses. So one being the worst. And I don't want to hear any shit from you about you not doing uh, rating systems and you don't like them and you don't like stars because everything. I don't give a fuck. You're on my show, Andrew. I'm not going to take any guff. All right. Yeah. Oh, God. One, between one to five, one being the worst, five being the best, what would you rate? So what would I you say, rate serial mom for upside down crosses? Okay, so just give me uh, just give me some time to talk to talk through the decision. Okay. Do you allow do you, just this is not for this movie, this is in general. Do you allow zero upside down crosses? No, you know what? Nobody's asked, ever asked me that. I'd have to wait until uh, it was a proper movie. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> but I was trying to build the calibration of the scale. Yeah. So, like you said, I don't we, at this point I don't. Rewatchability is very important, right? Rewatchability is very important. I feel like I watch this movie at w- once every year or once every couple of years. And I feel like this is a movie I'd want to watch. So that adds 
to it to, to its score. I would say I, I hate I hate doing it. I mean, I hate doing it. no go no go no go no go. Uh, I'm gonna give it a fi- I'm gonna give it a five five wow. upside down crosses. Wow, and, and, brave. How, brave. How's that brave? <laughs> just, I'm fucking with you, man. I just want to say this. I did want to say this. So uh, it is. Um, it's just really good, and I feel like you're out. I, mean, I, I I know why you classify it as horror, but I know that you also have these really strong definitions about what's this, what's that. So you classify it as a slasher. I would, uh, yeah. I mean, a movie could be more than one thing. Like yeah. it's obviously it's a comedy, and it's an absurdist comedy, and it's it's a social commentary, and it's horror, but. Yeah, I mean, do you do you you don't see serial mom as horror? No, I do. I just I'm okay. surprised that I'm I'm just a, just knowing you in our other conversations. I'm surprised that you consider horror, but that's what I like about you. You're a big tent guy. <laughs> like about you. All right. So then, how about genre? Are you comfortable saying it's a slasher, or or would you would you place it somewhere else? I don't. Know. I mean, the thing is, I don't even know how I'd place it. I do see that I, I, would, I would place it as a comedy, honestly. Um, like a horror comedy, just a straight up horror comedy. I would. I, <laughs> I'm gonna hold you to this, by the yeah, way. No, I, any I, answer you give right now, I feel like is it, legally binding. I feel like it's a comedy that is definitely steeped in horror elements, and and, and that's. I don't know. I, I don't. I so, don't do, I don't do these classifications like you guys. How about dark comedy? Would you say? Like oh a dark yeah, word? yeah. It's a dark comedy for sure. <laughs> Literally, he said, "Yeah, I don't do these classifications." Oh yeah, it's definitely dark comedy. Hey man, I'm a, I'm no a pause in those words whatsoever. You know what I like about you? You accept me for who I am. I'm a man of contradictions. <laughs> Very many contradictions. A lot. Uh, Okay, so you give it five upside down crosses. Okay, five upside I, down. I, I can see that. Yeah, and then what for the right side up? The scale? <laughs> no, it's only upside down crosses okay. here. Okay, all right. All right. Um, I think uh, I don't know if I can go five with you, but uh, I really enjoy this movie. I would probably give it four upside down crosses. It's really fun. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend it. Probably shouldn't be listening to this this far in if you haven't seen it because we kind of spoiled everything but if yeah if you haven't seen it yet i definitely recommend it i don't think it's gotten a blu-ray yet which is kind of frustrating because i have a lot i don't think a lot of uh, most of his movies i mean if you go try to rent them they're like really expensive this one was this one was reasonable uh so next step uh in order to absolve you of your horror movie sin i would normally uh assign you three movies however (laughs) It's not gonna happen. But so you're just gonna you're just gonna burn in the fiery pits of hell, and I get it. Like that's fine. It's cool. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't have time not to burn in the fiery pits yeah, of hell. Yeah, exactly. But can I just ask you if you were if you were to recommend me three movies to watch, what they would be? Yeah, I, and I wanted to do that for for my audience. So yeah. so just uh, you know, chill, Andrew, chill. It's gonna happen. Just hey, father, on. I'm just trying to speed <laughs> things along here. All right, Andrew. So uh, as we said, in order to fully to be fully absolved. Typically, I would assign you some movies. However, you're already burning in the fiery pits of hell from the previous movie that you uh, that you came on to talk about. So I'm just going to let my audience know some recommendations that I would give them if they liked Serial Mom and they're looking for something similar. First would be uh, Death Becomes Her. Great, great movie. Um, second one I would say would be So I Married an Axe Murderer. Yes. Starring Mike Myers. Is it Mike, Mike or Myers. Mike? Definitely Mike Myers. Mike. <laughs> and then uh, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. These are like 90s classic horror comedies. Um, I think they, they they would fit along really well with Serial Mom. So those would be my three recommendations. Yeah. So. I think and that becomes I, there's a really, really good movie. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a great movie. So, Andrew, I wanted to thank you so much for being on the podcast your second time. Yeah. Your second time, and Zach is ahead of you. He's been on here three times. It's not a Hillary's ahead of you. She's been on here twice. It's not a so now, now you guys are, are tied. It's not a competition. <laughs> it's about having good conversations. That's true. Yeah. So I'm sorry I failed. No, this is great. This is great. I told you, this, this is a different type of episode. We're fast and furious. So 
if you could please let my audience know where they could follow you, how they could support you. Uh, do you have a pay? You have a Patreon. Hit hit up the yeah. Patreon. Everything. Okay, let's talk about this. Five G Killed God dot com. Five G Killed God dot com is the the main access point to my my web store. So that's spelled out F I V E G E E O. The letter five. The letter five. <laughs> Leave it in there. A man was holding up his his five fingers and said the letter five. Yeah, the number the number G. So <laughs> the number five and then the letter G and then killed god.com. Okay. And then also if, if that's too complicated, like it obviously is for me, popefight.com. P-O-P-E fight.com. It goes to the same place, and I'm on Twitter a Hilbert three thousand. I, I I'm totally useless on there. You don't want to follow me. You do want to follow him. Um, how about the the Patreon? Oh, don't I'm not even just just <laughs> buy my book. You Patreon. What a what? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Andrew has two lovely children who would love for you to support him. By go- going on his Patreon and signing up for that, any amount you can do. Just buy his buy books. Buy this book. man is amazing. Just he's hilarious. Book. He's funny. He's got a beautiful, you can't see it right now, but his mullet is just amazing. I thank God for it every day. I thank God that may- maybe he's still alive. I don't know because I heard the 5G killed him. 5G killed God.com. Don't gag God, gag God's you. God gags you. There we go. All right, and if you would like to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at MHCPod. You can follow me on Instagram at MyHorrorConfessional. If you'd like to email the show, you can email me at MyHorrorConfessional at gmail.com. The music was done by Taylor Fox. You can follow her on Instagram at the Taylor Fox. Uh, her band, Great Hag, is going to be dropping an album pretty soon. I've been saying that since this, uh, since I've been making this show, and I'm hoping that it comes out pretty soon i think they're uh in production right now the artwork was done by my friend captain mikey you can follow him on instagram at captain underscore mikey underscore art thank you so much and we'll talk to you next week